And again, yeah, let me welcome you first uh, again to our Administrator of the Year campus lecture. Uh, annually, the faculty of the George Romney Institute choose an outstanding public servant to recognize it as Administrator of the Year. This year, we honor Senator Robert F. Bennett. Uh, my name is Rex Facer, and as uh, Professor Hart uh, mentioned, I am the chair, uh, together with uh, Vicki Okerlund, of the Awards Committee. And I'm on the faculty at the, Romney, at the, of the George Romney Institute of, of Public Management. The Romney Institute hosts BYU's Master of Public Administration program. And the program seeks to prepare leaders of exceptional capability and integrity who are committed to serving their communities and improving public service organizations. Annually, we honor a person who exemplifies the mission of the MPA program. Since 1972, we have honored 41 outstanding public servants with this award. This year, we're delighted to honor Senator Bennett as the 42nd recipient of the Administrator of the Year. Senator Bennett has exemplified the character and integrity in public service that is a hallmark of the recipients of this award. Senator Bennett has had a long career in public service. During his career, he has served in the National Guard, served on the staff of two different members of Congress, and was the Director of Congres Congressional Affairs for the United States Department of Transportation. He also worked for several years in the private sector. <clears throat> However, the call of public service brought Mr. Bennett back to government, where he was elected in 1992 and, has, and served uh, with distinction as a United States Senator for the state of Utah for 18 years. Bennett was widely recognized as an outstanding statesman serving on a number of very prominent Senate committees. During his time in the Senate, he was respected as a careful thinker who recognized that there are good people on both sides of the political aisle. Now, uh, let me quote from a yeah, few of his colleagues uh, from the Senate on their reflections on Senator Bennett. Uh, Senator Harry Reid, a Democrat from Nevada, said, quote, Senator Bennett is a very dear friend of mine. He is a very courageous man. He is a person who calls his political issues the way he sees them. Senator Reid also noted that, quote, there is no more honorable member of the United States Senate than Bob Bennett. Senator Dick Durbin, a Democrat from Illinois, noted, I have seen his passion for service. He has managed to stay true to his fiscal principles he gained as a businessman, while understanding the need for compromise when it was required of him for the sake of his state and the rest of America. Chris Dodd, a Democrat from Connecticut, connected Senator Bennett's approach in the Senate when he said, quote, I have always found Bob to be receptive to the ideas of others and careful and deliberate in his own evaluation of complex policy issues. Of course, that is not to say that Bob Bennett isn't also a determined partisan. Indeed, throughout his three terms, he has been one of the Senate's most consistently conservative voices. But despite that, Bob has frequently reached across the partisan divide to seek out areas of common ground and mutual interest, close quote. Since leaving the Senate, Mr. Bennett continues to be very involved in a variety of public policy issues. We are grateful to the Senator for the example of character and commitment to the public good, which he has demonstrated through his life of public service. For that, we recognize Robert F. Bennett as the 2013 Administrator of the Year. Senator Bennett. Thank you very much. I, I'm interested that the only people you were able to quote saying nice things about me were Democrats. <laughs> Maybe that was part of my problem. I had a, a, another thought during the opening prayer, which I hope is not irreverent. Lyndon Johnson, when he became president, called his first cabinet meeting to order and said, oh, I think we should begin with a word of prayer. And he called on a member of the cabinet to offer it. I can't uh, remember which one it was. This being the age of Google, you will look it up quickly while I'm talking, and some of them will correct me. And after it was over, <clears throat> the prayer was over, Johnson said, in fairly typical Johnson fashion, I couldn't hear you. Johnson had to be the center of everything. I couldn't hear you. And the cabinet officer replied, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, I will leave some time here for Q&A, and 
We'll get to uh, maybe some other uh, of this sort of thing later today if you want to join us. I teach it, sorry about this, uh, the University of Deseret. Uh, <coughs> this is the Timpanogos branch of the University of Deseret. Uh, you may not know that. Um, and I say to my, said to my students after I was giving them certifiably brilliant, brilliant information, uh, I said, what did you expect when you signed up for this class? And they said, we wanted to hear stories. So come to the afternoon session and you can hear stories. Maybe you'll hear a few today. But uh, my subject that I wanted to discuss with you, recognizing that you are at the beginning of your careers, whereas I am in the middle of mine, <laughs> that um, I want to give you a perspective on what you're facing in the world in which you will launch your careers that I hope will be of some value to you. And uh, <clears throat> I will begin with a comment from my father when I was deciding what to major in when I went to college. Uh, my career path was very clear. There was no question what I was going to do when I graduated from college. Indeed, I was already employed at my lifelong career job or employer. Hoped that wasn't my lifelong career job. I was the mailboy. But <clears throat> I was already employed at the Bennett Glass and Paint Company, uh, founded by my grandfather and run by my father until he went off to the Senate and then by my uncle. People ask me why I don't play golf. I said, at the Bennett Glass and Paint Company, there were two ways to get ahead. One was to play golf, and the other was to be named Bennett. And since I had the second one covered, I didn't bother to, uh, to, to do the first. But uh, Dad said to me, look, I can teach you more in six months about the paint business than any professor at the University of Utah knows. Don't major in business. Now, he said, take enough accounting that you can draw up a balance sheet and find your way around a profit and loss statement, and take enough economics so you understand how the system works, but don't major in business because your career is going to be at this business, and we can teach you this business here. The reason I'm sending you to college is to learn how to think. So after you've done your accounting classes and your economic classes, major in whatever you want as long as you learn how to think. That was very good advice some 50 plus years ago. It's still good advice today. I majored in political science because I was a political junkie. I've been interested in politics since I was eight years old. And yeah, I enjoyed the economics class. And I can draw up a balance sheet and find my way around the P&L statement. The Bennett Glass and Paint Company is no more. It was a casualty of the changing forces within the economy and therein itself is an important lesson. And I'll talk about that a little more. But if you learn how to think while you're in college, you have the skill you're going to need to survive. If you don't, if you focus simply on the kinds of things that have become the norm, unfortunately, in education, a norm that I hope is breaking, broken up, your college education is not going to do you much good. It's all summarized in one of my colleagues in the business venture who said, the only time I have ever been called upon to recall that Columbus's three ships were named the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria was when I was taking a test. That is not a piece of information that has been of any value to me in the rest of my life. And yet all of us learn the names of Columbus's three ships when we take a history class. 
Now, I would argue with him that uh, knowing that is useless. I found it very valuable while filling out crossword puzzles. It comes up as a clue from time to time. But most of the things I learned in college are no longer true. That is, they're obsolete. The world has changed. I graduated in 1957. The world has changed. Processes have changed. And if you don't know how to change with them, but you do remember to repeat by rote what you were taught by your accounting teacher 50 years ago, you will be of no value to anybody. Everything, even something as dull and as prosaic as accounting, has changed. Yes, you still have debits and credits, but that's about it in terms of anything stable from that time to this. Let me give you a little bit of history to uh, illustrate the point that I'm making. The, title of all of this, they said, what's your title? Well, I don't, don't come up with titles. Well, we've got to put it in a program. There's going to be a title. So the title of this is Public Service in the Information Age. So to be true to the title, let me give you this historical background for just a minute. I'm doing my Marco Rubio impression up here. <laughs> Somewhere, sometime, and no one knows when it was or who it was, somebody made a very simple but powerful discovery. And it was this. If you plant seeds and stay in one place long enough to harvest them, you create more wealth than if you are a hunter-gatherer wandering around picking berries and chasing mastodons. When that, that, some historians have called that the Neolithic Revolution. That's too fancy a word. I call it the Agricultural Revolution. As human beings ceased to be hunter-gatherers and became tillers of the soil and herders of cattle. I don't know who the first person to till the soil and stay in one place and get the wealth that comes from that was. I can say this at the BYU. Maybe his name was Adam. But when that started, life changed dramatically. And you had a number of consequences from that because that increased productivity. People say to me, what do you teach at the University of Utah? I say, I teach political science, economics, and history mixed together. Because you cannot really understand one without the other. I remember my high school history teacher saying, you cannot cut the seamless web of history. Well, it's true. When you add economics, it's a part of history, and then politics is a part of it. It's all a seamless web, and so you have to take it all together as best you can. So we start with the Neolithic Revolution, and it produces increased productivity, which produces increased wealth. You now have a barn filled with extra food. So you're much wealthier than the hunter-gatherer who has only what he can carry in his hands. And the consequences are, not only are you richer, you can now engage in commerce because you have wealth to trade with somebody and you get greater productivity out of commerce because someone who has a talent for training horses can make a living doing nothing but training horses, which he's good at, and he can trade his skill for somebody else's wheat 
because the farmer is good at raising wheat and the horse trainer is good at... And commerce makes both of them richer because the farmer now has more time to raise wheat uh, because he doesn't have to do something for which he doesn't have that much of a skill. So the increase in productivity means increase in wealth and increase in commerce, which means increase in wealth. And it feeds on itself. The next impact in society is people start to live longer. You've got food, you've got shelter over your head, you've got commerce going on that makes you rich. You don't die nearly as young as you used to. Economics is good for your health. Good economics is good for your, your health. My colleague in the Senate, Gordon Smith, who earns his living grazing peas, uh, <laughs> quoting him out of, out of school here, but he said to me, I raise traditional peas and I raise organic peas. I eat traditional peas because I know what you put on the plants to make them organic and I don't want to eat that stuff. <laughs> but he's got, a, he's got a cartoon over his desk that he described, here's a caveman and a cave woman. And she is saying to him, I don't understand it. We eat nothing but natural organic food and we die at 25. <laughs> okay, I'm off, but there's... <laughs> Back to the, the agricultural revolution. You get people living longer and you also get another side effect of increased wealth and increased commerce coming from the increased productivity you get more leisure time. If you're a hunter-gatherer, you spend every waking hour simply staying alive. You don't have any time for cultural pursuits or sports or religious contemplation or philosophical musings or exploration you don't explore beyond your own tiny little part of the world unless you have enough surplus food to keep you on a long boat, long canoe, long boat canoe through the Pacific Ocean taking extra food with you. That's extra wealth that you are using to support exploration. More people, increasing population, exploration to find other people, commerce, all of this comes from the productivity increases that occurred when somebody said, instead of being hunter-gatherers, let us become farmers and ranchers. And you track it through history, through the millennia, and you can see the upward, track, under, upward trend line in popula increased population, Increased leisure time, increased wealth, increased commerce, all coming out of increased productivity. Okay? Got that? Somewhere, somebody had another idea. And the idea was, instead of building things from scratch, maybe we could build something from interchangeable parts. The idea of interchangeable parts came along. Adam Smith talks about it in Wealth of Nations. If you haven't read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. That's an important part of your education, no matter what your major. He talks about pin making. Boy, there's a subject to stir the soul. He says, one man sitting down making pins all by himself can turn out about 20 pins a day. 
he has to straighten the wire, and then he has to clip it, and then he has to sharpen one end of it, and then he has to get the cap and make that, and then he has to solder that on top of it, and he's made one pin. And then he does the same thing. But, he said, if you have ten men, and ten of them do nothing but straighten wire, and one of them does nothing but straighten wire, the next one does nothing but clip the wire, the next one does nothing but create the cap, and so on, you can turn out something like 20,000 pins in a relatively short period of time. We call that the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution that followed the Agricultural Revolution was nothing more than adopting the manufacturing process using interchangeable parts. When we fought the Revolutionary War, one of the reasons we got the Second Amendment to the Constitution was that everybody had to bring his own gun. You didn't have a common gun for the troops. And that meant not only his own gun, his own ammunition, because my ammunition wouldn't fit in your gun. Every single one was a single work of art. When we fought the Civil War, the armories of the North turned out massive amounts of small arms because they were all created with interchangeable parts. And the ammunition for any one rifle worked exactly the same way in every other rifle because they were all interchangeable. And they had one factory making triggers and one factory making <coughs> stocks and one factory making barrels and so on, and then they all assembled them. In the agricultural age, if you wanted a carriage, you had to hire a team of carriage makers who would create a beautiful work of art of a single carriage, and it would take months, and it would take a lot of people. In the industrial age, Henry Ford could produce a carriage, name shortened to car, every three and a half minutes, simply by assembling interchangeable parts. All right, what was the impact of that increase in productivity? We've already had the list. The increase in productivity produced by the introduction of interchangeable parts meant vastly increased wealth. It meant vastly increased opportunities for commerce that follows the wealth, which produced more wealth. It meant population increases because people started to live longer as a result of their access to the wealth and it created increased leisure time. Universities all started out as extensions of, of the church. Most, not all, but most universities, most colleges started out with a religious institution behind it. Why? Because the church was the only aggregation of wealth, the only institution that could aggregate enough wealth to support a college. And the main, the main purpose of a college was to train priests and ministers. In the industrial age, the amount of wealth that was accumulated saw the rise of institutions that the divinity school became less and less and less important and they were training engineers and scientists and mathematicians and all kinds of things that people had the leisure time to take advantage of. 
the little red schoolhouse in the agricultural age was all the education people needed because, like my father and the Bennett Glass and Paint Company, they learned everything they needed to know on the job working on the farm. Now, as the farm begins to get mechanized with machines that are produced with, individual, uh, with uh, interchangeable parts, the farmer could stay in school longer. The farmer's kids could go to school something other than the little red schoolhouse and learn something other than the three R's and could be trained and could get to an institution of higher learning and then become doctors and architects and attorneys instead of farm workers. Massive, massive increases in all of these things I've talked about. Okay, the richest man in America in the agricultural age, we don't know his name for sure, a strong competitor for the title was named George Washington because it was the man who owned the most land. That makes sense. If land <laughs> availed, produced crops, and, and the agricultural age, is that's where the wealth comes from. The richest man in America would be the man who controlled the most land, and George Washington probably was the one. The richest man in America in the industrial age didn't own a farm at all. Actually, he did for, for um, entertainment purposes. His name was Henry Ford because he did the best job of producing a factory, taking advantage of the concept of interchangeable parts. Who's the richest man in America today? Pardon me? Who? Bill Gates. Okay. Bill Gates doesn't own a farm, doesn't own a factory. Somewhere, someone, and I used to know his name, so you might look it up at Google, I, I don't know, had an idea. Just as simple as the idea of planting seeds, just as simple as the idea of interchangeable parts, he realized that a vacuum tube could be either on or off. And if it could be either on or off, and could be turned on or off, much quickly, it doesn't have to warm up like a, an incandescent light, it could be instantly on or instantly off. That means it could represent either a one or a zero. It could be one of two symbols. A one or a zero. One of two. Two. Die. Digital. We get enough vacuum tubes wired together in a machine that would be bigger than this room, and we can string together so many ones and zeros that we can define just about anything. We can store information in a retrievable form that doesn't require printing. It's all electronic and all we do is access the right number of vacuum tubes that are on or off. Well, <clears throat> you don't even know what a vacuum tube is. You didn't live in those worlds. Some of the older faces around here are grinning because they know what a vacuum tube is. It has now been reduced to an electrical impulse on a piece of silicon that is either there or it isn't. Exactly the same principle. But as a result of that, a new language was created, digital code, and we had a new revolution as fundamental as the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution. 
The only difference between the information revolution and the industrial revolution is that it is coming at us 10 times faster than the industrial revolution did. All right? Run through the list. Already talked about wealth. Henry Ford became the wealthiest man in America because he did the best job of conquering interchangeable parts. Bill Gates became the wealthiest man in America because he did the best job of writing digital code. And if he has a farm like Henry Ford, it's just for entertainment purposes. In the 1790s, when we created this country through the adoption of the Constitution, 90% of Americans plus, 90% plus, worked on the farm. Today, 2.5% of Americans work on the farm. They produce more food than those 90% produced. Their productivity is not just because of the information, uh, the industrial revolution that gives them machines to do the planting, machines to do the harvesting, machines to clean the material. They use the GPS to lay out their fields. They use the information revolution to track the weather. The farmer is using information tools increase and through genetic information made available by the computer. We're getting, we're getting crops now where a crop can be, uh, uh, can be designed, a designer crop, that says this crop has all of the nutrients that it has always had. It's exactly the same thing except we've changed the genes so that it is now pest resistant. And we don't have to use any fertilizer or we don't have to use any pesticides or whatever it is and we get huge yields. And 2% of the population is feeding not only 100% of the population, but exporting food all over the world because America's agricultural might produces far more food, even though obesity is a major national problem, than we can eat. And we are sending it all over the world. So. Increased wealth, increased commerce. Walmart, the world's biggest corporation. They buy everywhere in the world, and they sell everywhere in the world. They could not exist without computers. They are a product of the information revolution. I used to work for the J.C. Penney Company. The J.C. Penney Company had one target in its whole, one mantra repeated over and over again, catch Sears. <laughs> Sears was the dominant retailer. Does anybody want to catch Sears today? Sears is in bankruptcy and Penny is maybe on the way. And Penny was number two, number three was Montgomery Ward. They don't exist anymore. And Walmart was a mom-and-pop kind of operation in Bentonville, Arkansas, but they got a hold of the computer. And Walmart now sells for prices less than pennies could buy back in the 1970s and 80s. You can go in to a Walmart store and buy as a retail customer at a lower price than the penny company could negotiate to purchase that time ago. Revolutionized the world. So you have increased wealth, you have in, from the increased productivity is at the heart of this again. More wealth, more commerce, population. We talk about the population explosion. And people keep saying, we've got a population explosion because birth rates are out of control. No, they are not. Birth rates are at all-time lows. 
Why do we have an increasing population? Because people aren't dying at anywhere near the rates they died in the industrial age. Medical breakthroughs made possible by the information revolution are saving millions of lives. Leisure time. Oh boy. We don't necessarily use it well, but uh, the kinds of things, I'll give you a very quick one just today. When my license plate expired back in the industrial age, I would go stand in line to wait to get to the desk where they would give me a new license plate as I would write out my check and get it done and all of the things connected with that as I was driving here from Salt Lake today to come, my car started talking to me and told me that my registration had just been completed online and where to go to pick up my decal, just tape onto my license plate. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to mail it to you because the DMV has the wrong address. But we're taking care of that electronically. What used to mean taking a morning off work to get your license plate is now done electronically. And the fact that it has been done is reported through my phone, through Bluetooth, on the car, while I'm driving on the freeway. And on and on. Increased leisure time. All right. Thank you, Senator Bennett. This is all very interesting. What in the world does it have to do with public service? It has everything to do with public service. Because as all of these things have happened, human beings have had to organize themselves to deal with the cultural impact and societal impact of these fundamental changes in the way humans live. And that means government. In the agricultural age, it was probably, in most cases, tribal government. And you got to be the chief executive officer by living longer than anybody else. Although humans being as they are, in many cases, you got to be the chief executive officer by being stronger than anybody else. And that probably meant killing off all of your rivals. I, I know it's not your favorite part of the Book of Mormon, but if you want to get an insight into what government was like in Asia, transplanted to America, Go back to the book of Ether, that part you skip over, and plow through all the kings and their brothers-in-law and their nephews and their sons-in-law who keep killing each other to become king. And that's the way they did it in that particular society in that particular time. When you got <clears throat> to the increased population and increased commerce, you had to have rules about how people would interact. Rules about who owned what property. Rules about transactions. Contracts had to be written. And then they had to be enforced. And that's all government. And just as society changed through these revolutions I've described, so government morphed and changed as you go through these changes I've described. So now we get to you and the title of this, Public Service in the Information Age. I, I say, I've used this a lot, that uh, the Senate is superbly structured 
to deal with the problems of the 19th century. The Senate structure has not yet entered the information age. Yeah, we all, we all carry cell phones. I went to the Senate, they gave me a beeper. This is the electronic age. You can go off campus, if you will, and the beeper will tell you when the next vote is going to be. So I went anywhere with a beeper. Next thing I know, well, you need a cell phone. I, I don't know. I, 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 beeper's fine. No, you need a cell phone. OK, so you're going to call me on the cell phone. The next thing I know, Bill Frist, the majority leader, is saying, I have some very important information for you. And we all pull out our pencils and say, OK, what is it? And he said, it's on your BlackBerry. Well, Bill, I don't have a BlackBerry. I know. I'm not telling you this. I'm going to put it on your BlackBerry. So all senators get BlackBerries. So we're wandering around with our blackberries. Boy, we're really with it. <laughs> and nobody had blackberries anymore. Now you got iPhones. And it keeps going. And I'm wandering along. And, and I, I look at Oren sitting on the Senate floor. <clears throat> it's against the rules to bring an electronic device on the Senate floor. Now, we all do. But if you pull out your blackberry and start do this on the Senate floor, they'll come to you and say, no, that's against the rules. The tradition is you don't do that. So I look at Oren, and he's sitting there, and he's reading. And I realize he's not reading a book. And I said, Oren, have you got a Kindle? And he says, yeah, it's great. You know, sitting there through these boring speeches, so I can read, the, you know, Love Me's Rob or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I got to get a Kindle. And I'm proud of myself. I've got a Kindle. And I look down at one of my colleagues, and I say, what's that? And he said, this is an iPad. I said, is it a Kindle? He says, oh, it's a lot more than a Kindle. It's a computer. That is the norm. Everything is changing 10 times faster than it changed during the Industrial Age. And that is the world in which you are going to make your careers. You're going into a time when productivity increases are just going to increase all the time. You're going to go into a world where population increase. Massive demographic changes in the United States. Birth rates in the United States are right at or slightly below replacement rate, which should mean the population will level off and stay exactly stable. It won't. It will continue to grow. Why? How is that possible if our birth rate is at is it, OK, immigration. And we will be the better off for that. In Europe, where their birth rates are way below replacement rate, but modern medicine is keeping the Europeans alive much longer, who's going to do the work? The percentage of the population in Europe of retirement age is growing dramatically, and the percentage of working age is shrinking. So they go to immigration, and unlike Americans, they cannot assimilate their immigrants. A good portion of the working force in Germany is Turkish, and they are in their second and third generation, and they're still Turks. In America, they come here as chambermaids and lettuce pickers, mainly f over the border from the South. And the second generation become attorneys and accountants and United States senators. I give this speech in Europe about uh, immigration and, and the importance of being able to assimilate it. And I say, Understand, America 
is the only country in the world that is not founded on a tribe. All the Germans are Germans. And when they bring in somebody to do the work, they're Turks. And they don't become Germans. The Al-Qaeda people who planned the, uh, the uh, bombing of the flights over the Atlantic were second generation British citizens. And they had not assimilated into British society at all. They were still Islamic with their roots in their own tribe. And I said to the Europeans, I said, look, who are the Americans? Well, we're Christy Yamaguchi and Michelle Kwan and Tara Lipinski and Ty Babylonia and Nancy Kerrigan. And those are just our lady figure skaters. In the Senate, we had George Voinovich, Serbian, Pete Domenici, Italian, Herb Cole, German, Ted Kennedy, Irish, Barack Obama, Kenyan, Barbara Mikulski, Polish, Bob Bennett, English, Mitch McConnell and John McCain, Scottish. And we don't think a thing about it. Our presidents are two Roosevelts, Dutch, Eisenhower, German. We've had Kennedy, Reagan, Nixon, and Clinton, Irish. The Irish have had a good run <laughs> for American politics. Now we've got a Kenyan. All right. That has become a hot-button political issue. Properly managed, that is a survival issue for America. Because improperly managed, if we cannot continue America's unique experience through our government and the way government works of assimilating all of the folks who come to America, we will begin the road to stagnation demographically that it, you find in Europe, Japan. Remember when Japan was taking over the world? The young students know. But the other, I, we remember everybody was afraid of Japan. The Hollywood movies were filled with conspiracy theories about how the Japanese were going to take over everything. Within not too many years, for every 100 workers in Japan, there will be 70 retirees. How do you maintain an economy with that kind of ratio? That's a governmental problem. Japan does not welcome immigrants. Okay, there is, I have said absolutely nothing that is ideological. These are not, quote, liberal and conservative problems. These are real problems. I loved the cartoon I saw in the New Yorker during the days of the Vietnam War where there was a young man and a young woman at a cocktail party, and the young man is saying very pompously, this is a moral issue. And the young woman looks up at him adoringly and says, I'm so glad. They're so much easier to understand than real issues. <laughs> You're going to face real issues. There is no Republican or Democratic way to collect the garbage in a municipality. But does your municipality need to be wired for optical cable? How will that change governmental services? Should you outsource? Historically, the city has always paid for this. Well, just because that's the way we've always done it, is that the way we should all continue to do it? In the information age, is there a better way of doing it? I have a nephew who earns his living training people on how to improve and maximize their <coughs> uh, 
computer capabilities in the IT world. He now teaches almost exclusively in the federal government. He comes back from the experience, he said, I say to them at the beginning of the class, if you will do exactly what I tell you to do, point of pride, you can take, he's a, Harvard, he's a BYU MBA. He says, if you will do exactly what I tell you to do, you can cut your IT costs 50%. And he did his first class with federal government IT executives. And they came up to him afterwards and said, we cannot do what you have told us to do. And he said, why not? And they said, because the budget process in the federal government is so rigid that we have to get this permission and then we have to put this application and then we have to get that clearance and then we have to get the other. And no. We can't do it. The Defense Department has spent close to a trillion dollars trying to improve their IT capacity with no discernible results. I was chairman of the Y2K committee because I tumbled on that as a major problem when the, the rollover from the 1999 to 2000, and all of the old computers were scheduled to fail on that. And the remediation had to be done, and we spent close to a billion dollars getting it done. The Deputy Secretary of Defense said to me, before you started beating us up on this issue, we had never done an inventory of all of the computers at the Defense Department. We didn't know what we had. And you forced us to take an inventory to see how vulnerable we were to this problem. And he said, we were stunned. He said, we had so much obsolete equipment that nobody knew anything. They couldn't talk to each other. It's just incredible how far behind we were. This is the Defense Department of the United States of America, presumably the most high-tech military in the world. And he said, most of you might not understand this statement, but some of the older ones said, we discovered if you had a 286 machine, you had a real hot item in your office. That's the world you're going into. Government never leads. Government only reacts. Government didn't create Microsoft. Now, government did do very important research. Al Gore didn't invent the internet. Government did. But government is not in the business of taking the basic research and the basic understanding and turning it into useful products. That's what private enterprise is for. Government officials of the kind you are hoping to become should be in the business of being up to date of everything that's going on in the information age and then going in and saying to the taxpayers or whoever is in charge of the budget, look, this is what we need. Why? The present system's working just fine. No. To stay up to date, to stay on top of things in the information age, this is what we have to have. And the cities that are doing that, and the states that are doing that, are the places where the economy is going well and the future looks good. And the places that are doing it the old information age way and we don't want to change are the places where the economy is bad. That's your challenge. So I end where I began. You're a college to learn how to think. Your challenge in a noble profession, because working in government is a noble profession, is to learn how to think in the terms of the information revolution. You are better equipped to do it than anybody else because you have grown up in the beginning of the information revolution. When I first got my Palm Pilot from the Senate, my seven-year-old grandson wanted to see it. 
And I showed it to him. And he said, this is great, Grandpa. Do you want me to set up a website for you on it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I use it to check the Senate calendar. I don't know. He grew up in that world. You grew up in that world. This is a tremendous opportunity for you. As you study all of the other things about government, don't neglect the advantage you have by virtue of your upbringing and your youth and your nurturing in the information age that you can become powerful change agents of the right kind in the information age. I salute you for your career choice and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bennett. Um, I hope everybody listened. Those were very powerful and uh, very powerful words that I think uh, provide a lot of foresight for all of you as you begin your careers. Um, and I hope you will take it all to heart. Thank you all for coming. Um, remember, we didn't have much time for Q&A today, but that's a great um, teaser for the 2 o'clock session. Yeah. Please come at 2 o'clock. He does have great stories. Um, and has a lot of insight into the way the world works today. And I think all of you could value from uh, coming to that session and, and hearing some of those insights. So thank you for coming out. Remember 2 o'clock downstairs in West 352. It's right next to the lounge for those of you that are MPA students. Um, wander in. Um, thanks for coming.